Shalom and welcome to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker. Mental health disaster is growing roots. Having sprouted from today's socio-political meltdown, we typically blame it on politics, but our angst is actually fueled by fear response processes gone awry within ourselves and others, both physically and mentally. Drawing from current understanding of disaster, brain science, cognitive development, trauma, and resilience, the Cogjam effect explains how to find healing through mindfulness, compassion, and re-enlisting reasoning skills we've honed since birth. Laurel Hughes is a doctor of psychology. She's participated in over 50 disaster operations, ranging from major catastrophes such as the events of 9-11 to minor local flooding. Between deployments, she wrote books and developed numerous programs and training materials for agencies and organizations that provide mental health services following disaster. Now semi-retired, she's still watching and listening and stepping back into the ring for this opportunity to out the cog jam effect. The Dr. Hughes may be reached through her website, thecogjameffect.com. Joining us now to talk about her book, The Cog Jam Effect and the Path to Healing, Divisive Community and Fractured Science is Dr. Laurel Hughes. Laurel, welcome to Revealing the Truth. Thank you, Eric, and happy election day. <laughs> happy election day to you too. Um, before we get into all of this, um, the definition of cog jam, so that our audience really understands this noun uh, that we're going to be right. talking about. Okay, cog jam is kind of a, a vicious circle we get ourselves into when we've been dealing with stress for a long time. It's where uh, our gut brain wants to act out to protect us because we're feeling some kind of a threat. And then as we don't contain it as much as we need to, uh, we end up alienating other people to the point where their gut brains are activated and they act out towards us. And so we end up in kind of a vicious circle. Uh, it has to do with the fight or flight mechanisms and, and the chemistry that's released. We end up uh, with too much adrenaline for too long a period of time and we start burning out which is something I suspect all of your viewers are familiar with right now, with everything we've been going through right now. And, and so because of that, we aren't using our upper intellect as well as we might if we hadn't been having all this adrenaline pumped into us. So that's what cog jam is. And, and so what I'll be looking into is what do we do about cog jam to get us out of that cycle so we don't self-perpetuate each other's gut brains. I looked up the word cog jam. It's uh, actually a noun, a self-perpetuating cycle of confusion, emotional reactions, and defensive behaviors between two or more individuals caused by overtaxed fight or flight neurochemistry resulting from constantly pressed panic buttons. Uh, it's a condensation of cognitive log jam. Well, yes. I think we can all relate to that uh, spiral, that uh, vortex we get sucked into based on issues that are triggered by either past experiences pulled into present conflict. And it's a, it's a hard place to be, but I think people find themselves. I, I got an email this morning um, and uh, I think maybe this is, is, is an example. Um, someone wrote to me and said um, they uh, have been going to a Bible study and for the last four years the leaders of the Bible study have been talking about their democratic political position and this person has been very uncomfortable with that being presented in a Bible study environment and it's been a, a, a rub. And um, we cover, as in our title, headlines, uh, or relevant biblical worldview of the world and what's happening in it. 
heart lines, the things that, that touch the believer's heart, and then straight out of the Bible, biblical teachings. And um, she was at a point where she was just in this, it, it's been going on for four years, and the conflict is just, I don't know what to do. Um, I, I, and, and my advice was, is well, you go to them in private and you tell them the Bible study is not the place for you to be espousing your political agenda. And they're basically in a Bible study taking your eyes off the Lord. That's not the service they're there to provide. And if they don't receive that, then you need to involve the pastor in bringing resolution to this, kind of a Matthew 18 kind of approach to, uh, but this person's been dealing with this for four years, and finally here it is on the verge of election. Uh, this Sunday really got to her. So she's been in this cog jam for four years and mm -hmm. has not been able to find a clear path out of it. And I think that kind of summates what you've encapsulated in this book is how do we navigate through things that are perpetually sources of conflict, not always exhibited externally, but kind of reflective of that inner battle. Um, makes me think of Paul. Paul says, uh, I do what I shouldn't do, and what I should do, I don't. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm warring in myself. It, mm -hmm. It's external things that might be triggering it, but the battle's not with them. The battle's inside of me. I, I have to live with me 24 hours a day. That's where the battle's raging. It's not Antifa and it's not on the streets. There's more going on inside of me, inside of my brain and in my heart that's this log jam of reasoning and um, <clears throat> uh, it, it, uh, it something that I never heard the name before but uh, I was fascinated by the concept. So in your experience, um, in your own faith journey, in trying to navigate these cog jams, these mental vortexes, these, these um, Bermuda Triangles <laughs> is, is, is what I think of. Um, does faith play a part in helping to navigate even the science? Absolutely. And I think uh, the best way for me to start would be just by saying what my own walk of faith has been since I was very young, and I happened to grow up in an atheist home. Mm. And so when I first started having those feelings of the, the spirit moving within me, I really didn't know what it was or what I was supposed to do with it. And when I would try to explain it to people in my family, they would just look at me blankly. And in fact, on one occasion, they thought I was trying to be funny and laughed. And of course, I was just devastated about that. So I made that decision at that very early age that, well, I'm going to keep these feelings to myself and just try and figure them out on my own, which <clears throat> in some ways is unfortunate because over time I ran into number of pe a number of people with Christian backgrounds or backgrounds of faith who could have explained to me what I was feeling, but uh, I didn't bring it up because I thought, well, I'm just going to get laughed at or I'll get in trouble with my parents because they don't believe the way they do and they don't want me exploring it, although I didn't know that if that was really true or not, but that's what my child mindset was telling me. Mm. And so over time, as I, as I looked at it, what I decided it was was a spirit of service in that when I felt that movement, it was usually because I wanted to do something for someone else. I wanted to volunteer for a group that was meeting some kind of need. And I did, in fact, as a teenager, get involved in those sorts of groups that were largely Christian-oriented. But, of course, we were teenagers then, and when we got together, we didn't talk about faith. We talked about things that teenagers talk about. Right. So, so it, it still didn't really—I I never got it put together. And, and I 
gone to Sunday school too, as uh, on and off as a child. We had a neighborhood um, church that I'd go to every now and then, but without anyone to coach me along, to me it was just a bunch of stories being told about some people who were nice people and lived a long time ago. So I, I had a, a general positive attitude toward it, but there was no connection between what was going on in my heart and what I might learn about the Lord. So what happened was, uh, it wasn't until I had become a, a young mother and was raising a family, and we decided to start attending a neighborhood church. And that's where I really became uh, part of a community of this understanding what this little light of mine in there all that time was really about and, and came to know the Lord. But then uh, what happened at that same time was around the same time that I was going back to school to finish my schooling. Because I dropped out for a while to uh, help my husband finish his and now the kids were older and I could go part time and get things finished up. And I decided to study psychology because I'd always been fascinated by it. I'd always felt drawn to it. And so I, I went for it, but then I found myself in a different kind of vortex, <laughs> so to speak. Because there's this kind of, this was back in the 70s, and back then there was a pretty heavy duty animosity going on between psychology and religion. It was like that the two shall never meet. If you believe in one, then you can't believe in the other. And so I, I'd go to school and I'd hear th things said about fundamentalist Christians, and I said, that's not true. <laughs> and, 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 and the same thing would happen when I'd go to church, and they'd say, well, that's science, and, and if you believe in science, then how can you be a Christian? And, and so I, I it was really stuck there in between, not knowing what to do. And what really saved me was a book that I picked up by Gary Collins called The Rebuilding of Psychology. <laughs> Hmm. That book, I think, is in about its eighth edition now. It's still out there. And he was a Christian psychologist. And what he did was explain what science was really about and how it related to uh, both religion and psychology. And that, in fact, the, the part of science that can run amok of our, our religious beliefs is, is not the data that's actually collected, the empirical method that we use. It's what happens afterwards when you take that data and interpret it and think of ways to apply it. That can happen in ways that violate our beliefs. And, and so that kind of gave me some direction. And it, and it kind of fit in with my, uh, I, I still to this day have that spirit of service within me. That's where most of my spirit seems to lie. And that what my goal was going to be was to bring psychology to where it could be understood by everybody. Uh, to introduce it to Christians, so to speak. And I was very fortunate to be there in the 70s when that was about the time uh, Christian psychology was beginning to get running and uh, Christian counseling. I began to be able to find books on that and Christian self-help books on various emotional issues. Uh, so I was able to read up on it and then in my volunteer time at the church, I was uh, going through those books and helping people understand how these principles of psychology are, are not ungodly, that they fit in right here and they fit in there. And, they, and this, this whole idea of uh, defining a group of individuals or a perspective on the basis of what you disagree with was really problematic because on most things we agree. And, and it, did, it went the other way too. It also gave me opportunity to, to show uh, science or scientists or people who practice science uh, what religion or the scripture specifically might have to offer them. Like I remember one time uh, I was talking with a professor who was all excited because he'd just gotten back from a conference on evolution and all the new data that was out that was explaining all the little bits and pieces of how they think it might have happened that you know we, we, we went from, uh, from mud to people. And uh, he, he made the comment, you know, one that I, I often end up <laughs> Here, would end up hearing is, well, I don't know how fundamentalists can believe what they believe when we've got all this evidence here. And so I told him, well, you're, you're looking at a fundamentalist right now. And uh, <clears throat> he swallowed his tongue and, and listened to me for a while. And I said, well, what you seem to be missing out on is that 
science has gone to through all this massive, massive exploration and research and gathered together all this data. And what they've found, what they're describing in terms of creation is in the exact same order that scripture describes it. <laughs> and now, why is it that instead of looking at that, you're looking at things that don't fit? I mean, just think of, you could get the iron against iron on these two, but what might they find if they work together and see where things match up instead of, well, they differ that way, so we just have to not listen to them. And, and so, well, the report just came out in the last 90 days that science now agrees that 90% of all <clears throat> human beings descended from one pair and that all animals um, appeared at the same time. So science is now verifying what we've always believed about uh, create about the creation story. Uh, years ago, I did a, a I had a, a medical doctor write a piece for a book for me about RNA and DNA, and the common building blocks of life that we share with a tree, that we share with all living things, carbon yep. and. Uh, and it's in the 95 to 97 percent range, depending on the life form that we share in common. Why? Because we're all made out of dirt, or we're made out of the same thing that God. Uh, so we would obviously have the same uh, fundamental building blocks, same chemical composition, uh, with then the variations for. Uh, gene and species and, and genus and species and all of that, uh, <clears throat> which is m maybe this is a cog jam, is that there's those out there that think that science is in conflict with the Bible and that the Bible is in conflict with the science. And it's created this um, <clears throat> Bill Nye the Science Guy <laughs> cog jam that people begin to believe and assign authority to their select group of scholars or uh, quotables, whoever they feel is the expert, and they hold so tightly to that that every time somebody brings up the subject of, their automatic go-to response is to rattle off this rapid fire. I get this with atheists all the time who write to me. Uh, they have this rapid fire uh, auto response. <clears throat> And when I say to them, you and I are so close together that we're literally at the top of a circle standing back to back, thinking that our view is a world apart when you're rigidly holding on to your position and all I'm asking <coughs> you to change is your perspective because we're that close together. If you just turn your head 15 degrees and I turn my head 15 degrees, we'll find out that we're, each, we're within each other's peripheral vision. We're that close together. But we've created these cog jams and because of them, there, they seem to be clear lines of division when in fact they're extremely blurred. And they're almost in, you have to be rapidly defense, in, in a rabid defense mode to close your mind off to anything that is new, which is when you think about the log jams that happen on the rivers where all the logs pile up and nothing is moving. Uh, <clears throat> that describes a lot of people. 
they're rigid, they're inflexible, they're unable to move off of a position. There's psychology there, and you talk about that in the book. That psychology linked to fight or flight, uh, um, the adrenal response, the, the chemicals that are introduced that freeze us uh, and cause us to become insecure if we open ourselves up to another opinion or another point of view. In theological circles, the peer group that I surround myself with has one rule. There is no right or wrong. Your position and my position can be on complete op on the same passage of Scripture. But I'm not going to say you're wrong, and you're not going to say I'm wrong. We're going to say, I've not looked at it that way. I'll, I'll examine it. I may or may not change my position, but you are free. <coughs> And it does not cause me to be uncomfortable or, or uh, uneasy or defensive because there's no condemnation. Is that a big factor in this, this cog jam of people feeling uh, if I don't defend my position, uh, I'm going to be rejected, or there's a fear of rejection, or there's a fear of, of being shamed. Yes, and what it boils down to, <clears throat> when you're into ideas like that and you have trouble letting go, it's not really initiating with your intellect, with your thinking brain. Instead, it's your gut brain, which is the one that's designed to protect us. And there are a number of traits that the gut brain has that uh, result in us behaving the, the way that we do. And it doesn't think the way that our intellect does. I mean, it, it, what it's doing is it's, it's there to protect us. Like we need fight or flight. We need that surge of adrenaline if we're walking out into the street and a car comes racing up and got to jump out of the way. If you had to stop and consult your brain, well, what should I do now? Uh, th that would be the end. I mean, it, it saves us that way. So it's a good thing. But the thing is, it wasn't really intended for these intellectual type uh, arguments or, or threats, so to speak, that we find ourselves up against. So what happens is it'll just be going about its way, scanning the environment for something that doesn't look safe. So it's, that's why we have a negativity bias, <laughs> that uh, we tend to glom onto the negative. That's our gut brain telling us there's something you've got to look out for out there, or why we can't change, because change is unfamiliar. The gut brain doesn't want change. Change is scary. We've got to stay away from that. It might get hurt. I mean, it might be dangerous. Who knows? And it's up to the intellect to decide it's going to step in and take another look at that and say, well, am I really under any kind of a, a, a dire threat right now? And what's this really about? And what might I do to break pattern? It, interesting what you're saying because <clears throat> I am the kind of person that will walk in the room and I'll notice something out of place. I'll see a picture that's crooked, and, and that's my bias. Walk into a well, large, ro large room, and I'll see, that's what my eye will be drawn to, is what's out of order as opposed to what's in order. Uh, why? It's the gut brain again. It's telling you, you need to look for something that might not be quite right. Like, is that picture crooked because uh, someone just broke into the house and ran past it or something like that? And, of course, we don't get that uh, detailed about it as we're thinking about it. But that's what the gut brain thinks. It says, uh-oh, there's something wrong here. And, and it's important that we do notice those things, but it's what we make of them afterwards that gets us into trouble. 
You know, it's interesting because I think that there's that it, as as you dealt with trauma. Trauma has an after. There's there's always an after trauma effect. It can be tapering down to resolution and passes, but there is a process. And um, we've learned so much about PTSD, uh, this whole post-traumatic stress syndrome um, that it seems that um, if we don't find a way to process it properly, it will skew every situation and turn it into a conflict. So That's the potential. how do we positively navigate through that? Well, it depends on where your starting point is. Uh, one thing I want to bring out that's important for all of us is that we recognize that we've all been through an awful lot right now. Many of us are worn out. Some of us are outright exhausted. Many of us feel traumatized by everything that's been happening. Maybe the pandemic, the election, the, the polarization, civil unrest. There's just so much going on that's stressing us out. And when that happens, there's a tendency, uh, if we're becoming traumatized, to kind of pull back and pull away for a little while so we can sort that through and, and just avoid it for a while so we can think about it. And so what I want to encourage everyone who's listening to do is the first step is to re-examine yourself and where are you with all this and what are you ready to look at right now? Because listening to a certain program or reading a certain book coming into contact with certain information, that doesn't determine when we actually start working on these inner aspects of ourselves. If it's our resilience that makes that decision. Our resilience uh, is different for every single person and it will let us know. And uh, my view is that the resilience is very closely tied to the Holy Spirit, that the Spirit will move us when we're ready to start looking at it in more detail. But meanwhile, be kind to yourself, be compassionate about yourself, to yourself, not only because you deserve it, but because by being compassionate to yourself, you, you are more able to be compassionate towards others. And compassion is such a big part of healing from this because it so happens that the neurochemistry that uh, is involved with experiencing compassion is it actually uh, overrides stress chemist chemistry. So if you can bring up your compassion, that's something you can find within you that will actually help you lower all this stress chemistry that's making you do quick, unfortunate choices that are making things worse. So the, the bottom line here is just be kind to yourself, wait until you feel like it's time, and then start looking inward at what's really going on with me and, and where do I need to start addressing what's happening with me. It's so interesting how much psychology impacts what is imprinted on our spirit and puts us in a um, um, kind of a negative mode when there's so much positive. You think about, yes, there was tragedy, but if you're a survivor of it, the harvesting of the good of all that, the asking if I would survive this, what does God want me to do with this? There's a purpose behind it, and how do I embrace that purpose? That's the that's, that's the positive outcome that can come out of uh, this, these traumatic instances, uh, even yes. near-death experiences. Many people have uh, positive 
um, outcome. But yes, and go ahead. But that's not all. That's not the norm. Uh, well, it is and it isn't. Uh, there's this other thing that happens in addition to post-traumatic stress. There's also something called post-traumatic growth. Hmm. And post-traumatic growth can only happen if you felt significantly impacted, like you felt some degree of, of trauma or feeling overwhelmed because of some adversity, which I think describes almost all of us right now. There's all kinds of growth that can only happen because we find ourselves in a difficult situation and need to look somewhere else uh, besides our usual coping skills to get through it. And this is where people uh, during times like this become closer to God because it's something that they hadn't explored in this way in recent times and now they've found a new way where it really applies to what's happening to them. Uh, it's, it's where they find new strengths within themselves. It's where they learn new ways to cope uh, from watching and being with other people. Uh, there's so much good that can come out of it. Uh, one of the things that kept me going to disaster operations was watching all the people helping out. You just really see the good in people at disaster operations. Uh, sure, there's things like looters around and that sort of thing, but for the most part, people who get involved really want to help. And uh, people who would ordinarily not have anything to do with each other would be getting together and helping out in some way, you know, to stack sandbags or whatever. They'd normally not even speak to each other if they saw each other on the streets, but here they are at a time of disaster, pitching in to uh, uh, help with the disaster. And so this is something that was really rewarding to me when I went out on the disaster trail, was seeing the good, both in the staff who came and in the survivors themselves and the people in the community. Fascinating. <clears throat> Fascinating. We're talking with Dr. Laurel Hughes, author of her book, The Cog Jam Effect in the Path to Healing Divisive Community and Fractured Science. Sounds like a very heavy, scholarly, deep dive into science, but actually it is something that will give you a great deal of understanding as to how you process uh, you can identify with your response mechanisms and things that have had either a negative or positive effect on your life based on life experiences and how to process them based on the science and understanding how we have an autonomic nervous system. We also have this auto response mechanism that we develop over time, which is this gut brain that we haven't really considered before that we have this auto response mechanism. And if we stop and we look and we examine it, we can find that we can adjust how we respond to circumstances, situations understanding, through faith, and through analysis. So fascinating topic, fascinating read. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we're going to talk about um, rationalizations. We're going to talk about groupthink. We're going to talk about how we're impacted by uh, others and how Oftentimes we blend in and buy into something because that's the wave and we're getting caught up in the wave and we need to find a way to pull back from that and um, <clears throat> reassess. So we're going to take a short break and we'll be right back. Shalom. I'm Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker, inviting you to join me and my special featured guest twice per month with Rabbi Zeb Parat and Carl Gallops, and monthly with Dr. Michael Heiser, Dr. Michael Lake, Dr. Timothy Jennings, Dr. Mark Baker, Dr. Jeffrey Johnson, Drs. Michelle and Mark Sherwood, Dr. Kim Moss, Derek Gilbert, Peter Rosenberger, Brandon Gallops, Steve Fair, 
Stephen Black, and Sean Tabbitt for in-depth insights into Israel, prophecy, the unseen realm, the brain, spiritual warfare, overcoming shame, mysteries of the Bible, prophetic insights, the sensational and the supernatural, caregiving, addiction recovering, understanding the divided heart, same-sex attraction, and much more. We're proud to feature some of the greatest biblical minds from both Israel and around the United States. Check out our featured guest lineup and 24-7 feed on IgnitingAnation.com or watch by topic on any device with our free apps. If you can't find what you need, you're just not looking in the right place. Follow us on social media and download our free apps today. With today's smartphone technology, news, information, sports, and entertainment is widely available and almost unbounded. But what about the information that believers in Yeshua are looking for? Well, now there's an app for that. Igniting a Nation now has apps available for Android and iPhone. With our app, you'll gain access to everything you would in our website, from our featured guests to our live streaming shows. Visit Google Play or the Apple Store and download Igniting a Nation's new app today. Shalom. I'm Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker inviting you to join me and Israel's number one rated guide, Edo Kanan, for our annual Israel trip. Our 2022 trip is now open for registration for our 18th trip to Israel. Our trip will take us from Tel Aviv to the Galilee, down to the Dead Sea, and four nights in Jerusalem. You will walk where Yeshua walked and watch the Bible turn from black and white to living color. Visit ignitinganation.com forward slash events and download the registration form today. No, it's not too early to take advantage of our payment plan designed to fit any budget. All of our trips sell out and we want you to experience this life-changing journey. Registration is now open for April 2nd to 13th, 2022. And we promise you, you will never read your Bible the same way again. Shalom and welcome back to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker, and we're talking with Dr. Wall Hughes. You can find out more about her at thecogjameffect.com, talking about her new book, The Cog Jam Effect and the Path to Healing, Divisive Community, and Fractured Science. Laura, welcome back to the program. Thank you. So, you're retired. You're looking. Well, I was. <laughs> you, 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 you're retired. You're looking out at this whirling dervish of people polarized over politics. I guess that's what's really stimulated this: is the divisiveness of a nation. And it's, it's actually at the core of one of my huge spiritual struggles. I'm actually in, in the process of writing a book called Confused by Christianity, Confessions of a Jewish Believer. Why faith in Jesus is not enough to unite um, the body. Why there's so much division when we agree that Jesus is the Messiah. And that should be the biggest thing that binds us together. And it seems to be that after that, we don't agree on anything else. Now, I spent 44 years in the synagogue. The only thing we agreed on was Jesus was not the Messiah. And our life was filled with conflict on every other matter. That was the norm. And that was fine. But then when I became a believer... I thought, well, I'm joining together with a body. I'm joining together with like-minded, with like-spirited. And I found out after 25 years, it's just as divided as the rest of the world. And that to me is confusing. It's confusing. For you, looking at the divisiveness in the world um, stimulated you to write this and to say, hey, from a psychological standpoint, here's what you're doing and here's what you should be doing. 
Right. And here are some of the reasons why you're in this rut and you don't respond differently. I'm going to show you if you'll stop, it's like stop, drop, and roll. Stop, look, and listen. Uh, if yes. you'll just stop for a moment, understand what it is that this response mechanism that you have in you is what's triggering all this. You can turn that switch off, but this is the process which you have to do it. So there is a, a group think. There is a mob mentality. There is a um, herd mentality, if you will, that you observed out there in these situations. So how do we contend with that? Well, a lot of it has to do with, well, first of all, before we get into it, there's a tendency for people to start judging themselves because they've fallen into a groupthink mentality. They're acting out and doing things that they know better than they should do when they're interacting with other people. And uh, that just makes things worse. That just scares the gut brain even more. And so that's one thing I, I want to do right now is to say all of this that has led to this kind of a groupthink mentality is perfectly expectable given how our chemistry works and given how our gut brain reacts and the, the personality traits of the gut brain, so to speak. That uh, it's, uh, I, I hesitate to use the word normal but it's, it's common and it's expectable that this is not something that means you're, you've had some kind of moral failure or spiritual failure. It's because there's this chemistry that has the power to override everything else if we don't step in, because it needs to override everything and step in when it's something truly dangerous and a dire threat. But it keeps getting applied in these other situations like the political vortex. So uh, there are certain traits of the gut brain that have been making us do the things we do. Uh, I already mentioned the negativity bias, and I already mentioned the lightning speed that it functions at. Another one is that it looks for an object to either run from or attack. If it identifies a threat, then there's got to be something out there that it can attack or try to hide from or whatever, do something protective. And of course, for the things that we're going through now, th that's not really true. It's just the divisiveness that's causing the problems and stirring things up. But uh, instead, what our gut brain does, it says, aha, there's a person who believes the opposite. That's not what I believe. Or here's a group, here's a philosophy, you know, all these things that it identifies, these concrete objects that a gut brain can actually latch onto and, and attack, which of course it, it, we kind of go along with if we don't step in and say, now wait a minute, I'm not under dire threat right now, and, and what, might, what value might I get out of sitting and listening instead of trying to jump in and express my own view and alienating these people. So that's another characteristic. Uh, another thing is that it only, in, in this process of identifying something to attack or flee from, it's, it's kind of an um, on-off switch. It's not a dimmer switch. And so it sees blacks and whites are all or nothing. And that's kind of what has been getting absorbed into a group thing mentality. Or even clear back when I was in, still in school and uh, was having uh, people with a science orientation tell me that fundamentalist Christians are all like this because there might be some people who believe this and that's ridiculous and so they just throw out the whole population as being somehow faulty and and so we do the same thing uh like when we throw out science we're, we're just taking one little piece and making that the whole uh that is it science is either all good or all bad and when in reality science isn't even a belief system you can believe in both because you don't believe in science science is something you simply understand it's a tool it's a system that we use to determine the reality around us. We gather information with it, same as we gather information with our with spiritual enlightenment or our intuition or something like that. The, the trick is just using the right tool for the job. But the gut brain doesn't understand any of that. Your own intellectual brain has to introduce that. And uh, the, the way that you actually start, there's all kinds of other traits to the gut brain that apply, but 
where the key is you need to recognize when your gut brain has been triggered and you do that by slowing down because it, you can't slow down and react at the same time or at least do an inappropriate reaction at the same time and then after you slow down you can actually look inside and say okay now what is it that has me feeling so threatened and and while you're right it make sure you tell your gut brain because the gut brain just wants to be listened to he's warning you he's trying to let you know you got to look out for something here if you tell them yes I noticed that threat and now I'm going to address it in the way that seems the most appropriate and that starts bringing the chemistry down and you can let the uh, intellectual brain rule and then you can look for ways to break pattern how might I respond to this person or this situation so that I increase understanding and compassion instead of uh, just building up more negativity and alienating people. It's f fascinating to me. <clears throat> um, you put this book out there in hopes that people would walk away with what? What I would really like people to do is number one, understand that what's happening is not something that means they're crazy. Because <laughs> that's what happens to some people when they start having mental health symptoms. Because it was actually in addition to the d divide that I was looking out at in my community, I was seeing mental health symptoms that I had previously had only seen on disaster settings, at least in that in the large numbers we have them now. And so First, that people understand that they're normal. Uh, second, that this is something chemically caused, not morally caused or spiritually caused. And third, that by slowing down and listening instead of talking and breaking patterns of how they used to interact or how they interacted in the past when they've gotten into these difficult situations, uh, they can both lower their own stress and lower the other person's stress. Turning on compassion is so important because it, it kind of resets your chemistry. And if I, if anything else, uh, I, I think those are the most important things. And you might notice that something I was going to comment on is that the book is in fact written from a secular perspective. That's why it, when I was first looking for some place to publish it, I went to secular uh, publishing houses. And the reason I did that is because this is for everybody. Uh, it applies to Christians, uh, but it applies to non-Christians too. This is a parts of science that both of us can make use of. And at, at this point, neither population has something like this. And so now it, it's out there now, and some people will be ready to pick it up and, and start reading it right away and making some changes. Others might have to wait a while because they're just feeling a little too burnt out still to even look at it, which is something that I found out when I took my book to job fairs, was that even though it was about healing, I said, no, I can't look at that. <laughs> That's, they're, they're just too overwhelmed. And you need chance, a chance to heal all that a little bit. And you know, turn to the Lord. I mean, you can use your brain during this time. So brain is required to tell us to look to the Lord. Right. And that is very definitely a way of healing. It's been demonstrated, in fact, in science that uh, fundamentalist conversion actually can cure alcoholism, <laughs> or appears to be a cure, <laughs> anyway. And it, plus a number of other things that that is an asset we have in addition to all the things that uh, science provides. As I look at the whole concept and have read through it, <clears throat> I think you're exactly right, that when you're in the midst of the emotions of uh, circumstance, you need to kind of get just uh, a little distance between yourself and the circumstance. Uh, it's good that the election is happening. There's going to be an aftershock. Either way, there's going to be an aftershock. And uh, maybe the timing of this is, is exactly perfect. Is this is the kind of thing that yeah. if I'm going to do over my holiday reading, how do I disconnect from the adrenaline of all that we've been through leading up into this election cycle? 
how, yes. do I, how do I prepare for the new year to not allow or empower circumstance to dictate my response, but for me to have cognitive reasoning, spiritual presence, state of mind, state of spirit, balance between uh, my brain chemistry, which <clears throat> I do have some control over, learn how to find that balance that we need in order to navigate life and do it at a time when you can you can't be too far away from something because I can't compare but uh, so you need to be somewhat in proximity to one of these circumstances not necessarily 9-11 but the election cycle being one of them uh, so I think the timing is really uh, significant um, that you could be weeks away from the event, um, even a wound surgery that you had on November the 3rd by December the 25th, you're in the recovery stage. This is a recovery kind of process that says, <clears throat> how do I want to prepare myself for future encounters? And how do I want to equip myself so that I don't have this cognitive log jam and I can't reason well, I can't respond well, and I find myself doing the same things, repeating the same things, and still having that sense of unrest and uneasiness. So, uh, right. So it's really important, I wanted to make sure I got out, was that part of what keeps stirring things up is that we hear so much about the disagreement, we don't hear so much about the people who are trying to heal the divide. And it so happens that there's literally hundreds of grassroots organizations out there whose focus is how to address this divide and how to make it so we can have civil discourse again and be able to understand each other and come together into the gray areas and do some uh, solution finding. And I've become involved with a number of them, like one of them is Braver Angels, and, and they're, they, they're all about trainings. So, <clears throat> look think, it up, National Conversation Project. Uh, I think that that's, a, that's an outstanding idea. We've been talking with Dr. Laurel Hughes, author of the book, The Cog Jam Effect and the Path to Healing Divisive Community and Fractured Science. It is not just self-help, it is finding a way to bring balance and reason into unbalanced and uh, skewed response mechanisms. Dr. Laura Hughes, thank you for sharing this with us here on Revealing the Truth. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. We're going to take a short break. and When we come back, we'll bring you the next edition of Revealing the Truth. <music>